The following program is a presentation of Grace Communion International and Grace Communion Seminary and is made possible by generous donations from viewers like you. On this episode of You Were Included, author of The Shack, Paul Young, and theologian C. Baxter Kruger continue discussing the shack, religion, and the hope for a new understanding of relationship with God. Our host is Dr. J. Michael Fazell. Great to have you guys with us. It's an honor to be here. Good to be back, Mike. You've been doing a lot of travel together uh, in Australia, other places, talking about the shack, talking about your personal story, Paul, and talking about the theology of the shack, Baxter. Uh, after you tell your story and people line up, mm. you know, Baxter's used, you know, talked about how big lines of people want to sure. talk. What's on their mind? What is it that you've said that has touched them? Mm. And what's, what is it they want to talk about? And it's not just the lineup. So, you know, I've gotten over a hundred thousand emails now from all over the world. And, uh, you know, a few years ago, I was shipping out soldering tips and cleaning toilets, you know, and people ask me what I do now, and I tell them I get to hang around burning bushes all day. It's because I get invited into people's stories. And there is so much that unites us, that, that religion has divided us over. And one of them is authenticity. And I think what people hear in my story, because I'm, I'm no different than anybody else, you know. Um, I've got great sadness in my history. I had a very difficult relationship with my father. I have sexual abuse in my history, not from family, but from the tribe that I grew up in, in the inside of. And then I went to boarding school when I was six and abuse took place there. And, and, uh, and all those things, they, they tend to destroy the house on the inside, the, sh the shack. It's a shack, not a, not a really habitable place. And that place becomes the place where you hide all your addictions and you store your secrets and, and, um, it's just, uh, it's a place of shame and, and you don't want anything to do with it. You hate yourself. You hate this place, which is your own soul. And then religion comes along and tells you that God also hates it. And uh, God wants a nice building. That's what he wants. And so you, you, you don't know what to do with the shack. So you build a facade outside, you know, a little quarter inch piece of plywood. You can paint as fast as you can pick up people's expectations and you begin to perform. And religion is about performance. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've rededicated my life to the Lord and, and prayed all night and fasted and, and on and on and on and on. Mm. The list goes yeah. of trying to earn my way into the affection and the approval of God. Because God was a, largely like my dad, someone whose acceptance I, I couldn't ever quite win and whose approval I never won. And, um, and you know, it, it, it took me 50 years 50 years to wipe the face of my father completely off the face of God. A process that just went totally into the inside world. But the facade that I had created, that I presented to everybody, you know, as the spiritual man, the, the person who had it together, was a facade. And God doesn't love the facade. He loves the shack, which I didn't know. I thought he hated it. I hated it. It seemed like my dad hated it. You know, why, why would I ever think that he would love that? And so again, back to performance. And I performed well. And it wasn't until my facade came crashing down. And that's what I talk about in part, is this struggle and, and the damage that the religious paradigm of performance, you know, trying to please God brought into my life. And to find out it's not about pleasing God, it's about learning to trust God. Well, that's like, that can't be right. Uh, that would mean that God would have to be a, of such a character that I could actually trust God. Let's go back to pleasing God, because then that's about me, right, and how good I'm performing. Yeah. And every yeah. religion is about pleasing God. You know, it's just the rules are different, or the criteria uh, is different. But as soon as you have it, you know how to compare your criteria against somebody else's and how good your performance is. And now you can be self-righteous because you're better than somebody. 
and, and you get a false sense of value and a false sense of worth and significance and all these things that you think is righteous and biblical and all this. And you say, oh yeah, I trust God. Yeah, because religion taught me to use that language. Do I really? No, just let the economy go sideways and I'll tell you, I start mm. screaming. Because, you know, fundamentally, I don't trust anybody. And uh, Mackenzie in the book spends a weekend in the shack which is the dismantling of his entire existence and the reforming of it mm -hmm. within the truth. That weekend represents 11 years for me. So when I talk to people, a lot of us who grew up in the religious community, we didn't even know that people could come to healing. We didn't know because anytime their crap showed up, we just kicked them out, mm -hmm. you know, which meant, you know, the rest of us really wanted to be transparent and honest about our stuff, yeah. right? And so we've got all this performance orientation. We're hidden. We're not authentic. And when I talk, they hear a couple things. God loves the shack. A lot of people don't know that. He crawled inside of it. He's there already, knowing everything there is to know about me. Authenticity, this drive I have to be real, is there because that's the way I was created to be. And healing is possible. The healing of the soul, the shack, not this performance. And God doesn't, he doesn't care about the performance. And in yeah. fact, the facade has got to come crashing down at some point so that real healing comes to me. But I tell you, we will hold on to that facade because that's where we've been told real righteousness happens, yeah. real spirituality is. It's a, it's, a, it's a lie. But again, it's all based on the fact that you don't believe God's good. I didn't. Not really, but I knew the language. I could tell you that I did, but I didn't even know that I didn't trust anybody else except myself. But that's because I had no reason to. So when people come and they talk, they tell me their stories. They tell me how the book has landed in the middle of their great sadnesses of one sort or another. They tell me about their histories and, and their abuse and the fact that maybe this is the first time that they have hope. And some of them, tell me they're terrified. They're terrified that if they take some little incremental steps of trust, that the God that I'm telling them about may not turn out to be the one that's Ooh. really there. And, and why should they take that risk? Right? And faith is about that risk. It's about beginning to believe in the certainty of his, of his character that God is love, that there is no deeper reality to the character and nature of God than love and relationship, and that God by nature doesn't, is not able to act in any other way, hmm. but the deepest way that we would sense love is. And so for me, that's the way I love my kids. That's the touch point for me. As a father, I would die for my kids. Well, if God isn't at least that good, then what kind of a God do we have? And a lot of times we think, no, we, we know how to love our kids better than God knows how to love his. I mean, he's asking us to forgive in a way that he can't forgive himself. And what's that? And that either means that I'm wrong or the character of God is wrong. And so why then should I trust him? And the question goes back to, who is this God? And I believe that he is in essence, good and loving all the time. And that means that judgment and wrath and all these words, hell and all this stuff, have got to be understood within the commitment to his goodness and his love. Everything else is defined out of that, not he, us out and here. And the goodness and the love part is why the Trinity is so important. Because Absolutely. if you've got a single isolated deity from all eternity, then that deity is, strictly speaking, alone and is self-centered because there's no other to be centered upon. It's unapproachable. It's impersonal. It's, um, it's not good because good is a, is a relational word, and it cannot be love because there's no other object to be loved unless it loves itself, and that's self-centered love rather than a long way from agape. So one of the reasons that the Trinity is so important, one of the reasons, is that it grounds 
a relationality, and it says that the core of God's being from all eternity is fellowship, is other-centeredness, is approachability, mm-hmm. is communion, is self-giving and self-sacrificing for the other. Said so for me, what is so foundational when it comes to trust, this is, and I'm not an expert on it, but I see it and I'm beginning to feel it, is that I can I can begin to trust the Father, Son, and Spirit because the only way they know how to be is the way they are toward one another and have been from all eternity. And that's the way they relate to me. Now, if I can see the Holy Spirit have doubts about the Father's heart, if I can see how the Father has doubts about Jesus or the Holy Spirit, then that introduces some kind of reason to not trust them. But when you look and see that the way the Father, Son, and Spirit love one another, as it's portrayed for us in the New Testament, the Father loves the Son, Jesus says, and shows him all things that he himself is doing. And the Son can do nothing except what he sees the Father doing. This is other-centered. And it's beautiful and it's good. And therefore, that's the way they relate to all of us. Now, now we've got a basis within the being of God of knowing that's trustworthy and good. And it's just towards me. The God of all is good, Athanasius said, and supremely noble by nature. Man, because that's the way God, and Athanasius, when he says that, he's not talking about a single, solitary, isolated person. He's talking about the Trinity. The God of all is good and supremely noble by nature. Therefore, this God is the lover of the human race. That's the only way we'll ever have trust. If somebody's introducing doubt into that, which is what we do 24-7 so many times in the Christian church, in the very way we package the gospel. Hmm. You can't trust that God. That's, that's, so when, when I get the chance to travel with Paul and I see people, I'm watching them. They, they're feeling, you mean, you mean God may be like me? I may not be just totally disgusting to God. He may like me. And stuff comes up, and I can I talk to him? It's, and begins to have that meeting and hope that maybe I can be loved like Mackenzie was loved. Maybe I can be included like, like Paul is included. It's just it's it's evangelistic. Is what it is. It really is beautiful. Before there's any time and space and matter, what is there? Because what is there before time and space and matter is what all time and space and matter is inside of. So what do you find before time and space and matter? You have a relationship of other-centered love. That's all. That's what you have. Now that's everything. And everything that is created is created inside of that and an expression of that. God hasn't changed. We are not powerful enough as human beings to change the nature of God. Religion tells us we are. We can make God not like us. We can make God hate us. We can make... uh, uh, we can do all kinds of things and then change the nature of the way God relates to me. The windshield wiper theology. It's that we have the power. God's our judge. He's our father. He's our judge. He's our father. And if you got the windshield wiper going, you can't have any peace at all. And I, what I say is God is our father, and therefore he will judge us to the core of our being because he loves us so much. He's not, in McDonald's, one of his great lines is he was, he's not about to allow us into heaven with a little bit of Satan in our pocket. Not, not for his benefit, but because that keeps us from being able to be free to have the run of the house. It keeps us from being able to be free to know him and to live towards one another in and out of that love. It's all rooted in that very simple yeah. thing about the goodness of God and the, and the love and whether or not the Trinity is the eternal truth of God's being. And that's where we went off in Western theology is we split uh, the being of God from the Trinity. And so that's a whole other subject. And, and a lot of times... We will define all of our religious language, not based in this relationship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but based in the projection of our own pain. So, for example, we'll take a word like holiness, which is such an important word, but we'll define it in respect to sin. That's how our fundamental definition is. Guess what? God was holy before there was any sin. So, fundamentally, holiness has got to be defined in a way that has nothing to do with sin because God was holy before there was any sin, right? That's a great point. But again, we want to define all our terms over here in the midst of all of our pain, all of our loss, all of our great sadness. And what Baxter is saying is, and, and what Athanasius is saying, and what Irenaeus is saying, and MacDonald is saying, they're saying, look, this is where we, this is where the action is. We have to begin here. This is the first part of our systematic theology, is to say, what is the relationship of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? And Jesus comes and says, nobody knows the Father. Nobody. Nobody. And he says that right before he says, 
So come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, talking about the impact of religion and how it just drives us into the ground. And the basis for him saying that is, you don't know the Father, but you've seen the Father. You've seen me. You've seen the Father. You know, you've seen me playing with the kids. You've seen the Father. See me with the woman at the well or the woman caught in adultery. Or see, or see me outstretched arms being crucified and beaten by the human race. You're looking at the Father. Yeah. That's, that's his character. It's exactly pictured for us in Jesus. Mm. And this is, issues, and this, he said, and this is eternal life that you may know the Father. Yeah. And Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. Having to do with knowing. And knowing the definition yeah. of eternal well, life. Intimacy you know, of relationship. When you know that you are that loved by that Father, it baptizes your soul with, with what the New Testament calls parousia. Unearthly assurance, freedom, boldness, confidence. And when that is going on inside of your soul, real healing, I, I can be honest and I can be real when my Father in heaven, real healing begins to happen. And that gives us, maybe for the first time, freedom from our self-centeredness long enough to begin to notice people around us. Notice that there are other people around us that don't necessarily know anything about that. And so to know the Father is to be put to peace and to be put to peace in our inner world means that striving and, and that churning as McKenzie taught me, Papa talks to McKenzie about, begins to go away, which means I now can begin to notice others and I'm free to give myself for their benefit, which creates fellowship. So that's life. It's the, life the eternal life is the life that the Father, Son, and Spirit live together. It's God's life. It's other-centered. And as we know the Father, then it works its way through us uh, in, in community, in relationship. And that only makes sense because the healthier you become as a human being, the more other-centered you become. The better father you become, the better spouse you become, the better wife you become, in terms of other-centeredness. If God was this lone, solitary being who then defines the universe based on that aloneness, then the healthier you got, the more self-centered you'd become, because that would be the character and nature of God. Which seems to be what some people are trying to say. And they are. And, Can't and for God to be self-centered. Yeah. Yep. Well, if he does some of the things that, that uh, people say he does, he would have to be awfully self-centered, wouldn't he? Yeah, and out of need of some sort. Yeah. And we're saying that everything that God would need is inside the relationship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that he has totally fulfilled within himself and now creates in order to share that life and include us into that life. Well, that's what Lewis is saying, that, that there in this circle there's no emptiness, but a plenteousness that creates us for one reason, and that is to lavish us with love so that we can share in that life. There's not, there's not this list keeping to see if we make the cut so we can get into this place called heaven. There's the Trinitarian life, and it's being shared with us so that we can share in it. It's for our benefit. That's the way God loves us. And that goes to what Baxter says all the time. This is not about asking Jesus to come into our life. It's about Jesus including us into his his life of the relationship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But a lot of times we believe in this distant God, and so everything becomes transactional, and it's about us asking this God to come into our lives and then proving by our righteousness that you know, he can stay there, rather than understanding, and as the Holy Spirit opens our eyes, to what Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have already included us into. That, that means that the question of the Christian life is who is this Jesus that's included me? What is his life about? And how do I go about participating in being a part of this? I'm included in that family. What's the dynamics? How does this work? Somebody show me. And Jesus says, I'll show you. Here's how it works. Abide in my love. Let me love you. Trust. trust he, he speaks of trust, belief, constantly. We want to say that he speaks of, of obedience to or, or law-keeping. But in fact, he talks about, believe me, trust me, trust the Father who sent me. He uses that kind of language constantly. You know where a, a surprising chapter where trust comes up over and over and over is Psalm 22, which starts off with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Mm -hmm. And you read that Psalm and it says, trust, trust, trust. And then it, at one point it says, because I know you will not turn your face from me, mm -hmm. right? And our whole, we come up with a theology in which 
You can't trust God. He's turned his face. He can't look on sin. He's gone somewhere, and he's abandoned his son, like every father would abandon his son. Come on. You know, I'm a father. There is no way, and I don't care. He's so righteous that he abandons. Right. And therefore, yeah. so so unlike his own son, because yeah. the son doesn't abandon us. So there's something becomes. wrong with our definition of righteousness. And there's a split between the character of the father and the son, because the father can't even look at us. He's disgusted. Yeah. And Jesus can not only look at us, he can enter into our world and become one of us. And in fact, the apostle Paul says, he who knew no sin became sin. So now you got two fundamentally different kind of characters in in the Father and the Son, and who knows what the Holy Spirit's doing there? I always say, you know, torn between two lovers or something. Like, what in the world? I mean, where does the Holy Spirit come down on this? The Father can't look at us. Jesus enters into our world. So, so where does the Holy Spirit fit into that? Uh, shuttle diplomacy. And back wow. to the windshield wiper. I mean, I'm with Jesus today, but I'm going back over. Yeah. It's just and yeah. and, and to even make matters worse, ultimately, then Jesus becomes the one who protects us from the Father. Yeah, shields us from the angry Father. Yep. I mean, that's just like, you know, living in a house where the Father's a drunk. Yeah. The, the boy wakes up in the morning, he doesn't know which dad's coming out the door, and the mother's yeah. standing there on the side right. thinking, am I going to have to defend my son? Is right. this going to be a good day? Yeah. And it, that doesn't create or relationship. The older or, sibling protecting the younger right. ones or mm -hmm. something. Yeah. It is a really, it's remarkably sad in a sick framework. Yeah. It really is. And I'm, that doesn't mean that everybody's ever propagated is therefore nuts. That's not the point at all. We all we're part of a family conversation. Yeah. But we've been brought in this family conversation to the place to where we can see this is really something that's sad and broken and sick and we don't have to hand it on to the next yeah. generation. And that's not that's not disparaging to our fathers in the faith or our modern brothers and sisters in the faith. It's it's just saying we don't have to hand on the family's dysfunction this time. We can stop this here and move forward. Because you never have trust if that trust is not rooted in the character of God. And when you've got the being of God ripped apart at that moment and two different characters and a third character that's kind of in between, there's nothing there to trust. Yeah. Now, recently, uh, the two of you gave an interview about hell, nature of hell. Can you talk about... Uh... Well, John McMurray was with the yes. three of us, mm -hmm. the three of us. It's a, it's a documentary called uh, Hellbound? Question mark. mark. And they've been interviewing a lot of folks, and so... Who's doing it? There's a, uh, a group of 2030s out of uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, southern BC, and it's funded by a BC guy. And, and, he, and he just felt like we need to get kind of all the different looks at this mm -hmm. on the table. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people within even the religious community, the Christian community, think that there's just one view, mm -hmm. right? Which is Dante's Inferno, or yeah. as you call the, the, the giant rotisserie. And that that's infernalism, you know, mm -hmm. that's the view that is the traditional view, which it, it's not. And, uh, but it's the one that most of us are familiar with. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're trying to ask the question, What's this conversation about? What, it, what does it need to be about? And what frames this conversation? So we, and, and where we started, and I think this was really beautiful, is that uh, in any given part of theology, but even especially when you're talking about judgment, suffering, and hell, the, the, the real question is, what is the nature of character of God? And for me, uh, I think Athanasius and early church answered that. The nature and character of God is Father, Son, Spirit relationship. And the purpose of this God in creating is to include us in that life. And now that we've been included in and through Jesus, to me, the Holy Spirit's task is to bring us to the place to where there's no darkness in us, where we want to participate in that life with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And to bring us to that place, to me, is what judgment is. It's the grace of God saying, I will divide here. I will penetrate down into the core of your being and help begin to divide out the darkness and the dar and the sin and the evil that's there because that's not going to be able to participate from the real Baxter or the real Mike or the real Paul. So that's the way I, I that's the way I would pull it through and I would see uh, hell as as a fiery metaphor for the purification, whatever form that may take. And for me, I I'm I real I think that there's a it's not like, well, you, everybody gets the same kind of fire. I think there's some real differences. People that gave themselves to participate in Jesus, you know, their whole lives, 
are in, and they're not in a different place, you know, spatially. I'm saying they've been giving themselves, they've been working through this, and they're being in the process of judgment and liberation all along. People who have resisted it their whole lives and maybe took a couple of million people with them in the process. It's, there's a lot of, of uh, refinement and transformation that has to happen for that. But we're not in a position to call those shots. That's Jesus yeah. in charge of that. It's even like the concept of wrath. You can put it inside the G.O.D. model of the distant uh, omnibeing God. And by G.O.D. you mean uh, the traditional understanding of God. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. Not the it's traditional, not the, the tradition. modern understanding of God. It's, it's the faceless, nameless omnibeing who watches this from the infinite distance yeah. of a disapproving heart. And that's how people traditionally tend to look at God. That's not how they saw him in the early church. Yes. And we would say the early church people were traditional. So, so yes. we're talking about definitions of tradition. And hell, exactly. hell is a... Traditionalist. And traditionalism. Traditionalism. Yeah. The traditionalism is the... The is popular the, view. Well, well the, the, popu current. the current popular view in Western yeah. culture. In, in is, North America. Yeah, yeah, is G.O.D. And if you, if you have that, then you've got the distant God who needs to be appeased, mm -hmm. which sounds like the Old Testament Baal or anybody else. Yeah, or the volcano. Or the volcano God or whoever. Yeah. But has to be appeased, and so he is... Uh, uh, he's going to have this sense of separation. Yeah. And, uh, and when you deal with wrath, then it's that God acting in uh, retribution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, um, but then if you put wrath inside of this relationship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the question is, does God do anything that is not motivated by love? Anything? Well, if the answer is no, because the love is the nature of God's being love, light, spirit, right? Then everything God does has got to be motivated by love, which would include wrath. And now you have the wrath of God couched in an absolutely different framework. And so when, if I have a child, which I'm thankful that I don't, but I have a friend whose oldest son uh, was a methamphetamine addict. My friend would have died for him, said that, right? And, um, but in, in loving his son, if he'd have had the power, he'd have gone after every piece of that addiction that was damaging and hurting and keeping his son from being free, keeping his son from experiencing life, keeping his son from being authentic, because it did, right? And if you are a father, you would go after that. You would want to be this fire that would burn out every piece of that. And, and I believe that that is the, the fire of God's love, that wrath is an expression of love, not this retribution, distant volcano god who requires certain sacrifices in order to be appeased. And, and this is a quote from George McDonald. Again, it fi figures into the basic perspective that Paul and I were talking about. He says, therefore, given who God really is mm -hmm. and the character of God, his Father, Son, and Spirit, and their love for us, therefore, because that's who they are, all that is not beautiful in the beloved, that's us all that comes between and is not of love's kind must be destroyed. Now that destruction is not, it's not the destruction of our being, it's the destruction of the darkness in which we're participating in. And it's not fun. It's not fun now and, and it's not fun however long it has to happen. For that to be all that is not of love, all that is not of love's kind, all that comes between us, uh, that is the Father's heart in us, has to be removed. And that to me is what the judgment is and, and that um, it's redemptive. And so if you know God loves you, if I know that, I will run and say, right. please do what you need to do to get the crap out of me because I don't want it. I don't want how I hurt people because of it. I don't want what it does to me. I don't, want, I don't, I don't like what it does to this world. So please do what you need to do. Because I want to be free. I want to be whole. And that's, I'm saying, come on. And, and the Lord will never be satisfied with anything less than that from us. He's not satisfied by the legal satisfaction of some law. Satisfied by having us full participate. Because we are sons and daughters of God, we must become that in our experience. And that's what he's talking about. It's something like going to the physician uh, for cancer. Isn't it a little bit? Uh, if, if, if you go to, let, let's pretend it's, you're going to the best cancer physician in the world, 
you want to get rid of the cancer. You do. Because you, you, because be free you know it. it's going to kill you. Yeah. And you're not going to get to participate in life anymore. If this is not, if this is not excised and discerned, which is the fundamental meaning of judgment, is to discern, to see, and to, to divide. And the process may be difficult, but it's... Uh, it can be hell. But it's better than... And, and the end product. Uh, of course, it's a physical analogy, but... Absolutely. But you have two different doctor of gods at work there. And the whole idea of this sense in which God has to have someone hurt, someone has Some to kind of pay. A, a blood sacrifice. A blood sacrifice, that to me is just straight paganism. I mean, what our father's after is how in the world are we going to reach them? How in the world are we going to reach Mike and how are we going to reach people? How are we going to reach people who are so broken and so damaged and so hurt, they think we're like that. And in order to bring them to be able to enjoy life in our house, what are we, how are we going to do this? And there's a lot of tenderness in the Holy Spirit's work with people. That's why I said there's differences. I don't think everybody needs to be hit by the head, in the head by two before. Yeah. Some people just need to be held for about 15 years. And, and know it's okay. I can, this is good. I can trust this. And, and, that, and to come through their pain and into liberation. But it's always about coming to see the Father as Father. He loves us forever. And when we, when we finally get to there, we will not need laws. We will not need Bob Wire friends, as my, my friend Ken Courtney says, because we will loathe anything that is alien to the life and the other centered care of the Father, Son, and Spirit. And we will do anything for one another that better their lives. It's so much more than fulfilling a law. It's actually sharing in the life of the Father, Son, and Spirit. But we're so blind and so broken, we, we don't even know how to discern life from death, light from darkness, heaven and hell right now. We just, we keep reaching, and we've got to be educated, properly understood, educated, and um, brought to the place to where we can discern those things and learn them. The Holy Spirit's not going to violate our personhood on that and just flip a switch and say, that's it. Now you got the enlight you got enlightenment. That's one of the things I love about the shack is it must be 10 or 15 places where he makes the point without violating your will, without violating your will, because God wants us in our hearts. And if he just waved the wand, then we cease to be real people. We're just now computers with Jesus software. Yeah. And that's not why he created us. No. It's about yeah. relationship. There's a huge patience of God in this. And I, li I love this part of the shack that has this figures into the discussion when Papa's talking about not ever being disappointed. And I mean, who in the world doesn't think they're a disappointment to God? But Papa's saying, well, it's going to take you 175 times or, or events or situations or traumas or things before you're finally going to begin to see who I am. So I'm not disappointed on the first two. We've only got this much more to go. And, and Paul and I were talking about this on the plane about our children. And, and what father is not thrilled the first time their child stands up to try to walk, yeah. even when they fall? Yeah. The act of falling is, is, is well, that's, you that's know number they're one. going to fall, yeah. yeah that's, that's number yeah. one. So yeah. you're not disappointed yeah. that they fail. Yeah. You're thrilled that they took the step. That they've gotten started. And what father's ever going to be content to leave it there until they can run? Exactly. And and so that disappointed sense comes from that evaluate that judge that's watching and keeping yeah. the list and say, oh, sorry. Yeah. But they I mean, they created us out of nothing. Yeah. They formed us out of the dirt of the ground. And then their goal is to bring us to be at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, anointed with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And they don't, you don't think they know, the Father, Son, and Spirit know that we're going to botch this up in, in the long run? But they, they see the larger picture. I think that's beautiful. I, I love that. That's one of my favorite things in the show. Three different times he brings that at once with each of the three persons of the Trinity. It's beautiful. Uh, Baxter, you've done some work on uh, a book, uh, The Shack Revisited, which is uh, in a final manuscript form. We need to get together and talk about that, uh, having to do with theology. Love to. Be that, sure. Love to. Uh, you got three days? Shack is really yeah. You've been watching You're Included, a production of Grace Communion International.